Hello, everyone. I'm Jim Garrison, and I want to welcome you to day 337 of Humanity Rising on this beautiful October day, October 12th. We're going to contemplate the relationship between wholeness and fragmentation today. And in order to appreciate the profundity of the uh, scientists that we're going to contemplate, David Baum, I would like to uh, recall the discussion that we had last week uh, about the solar cycle of about 11 years between what they call the solar minimum and the solar maximum and how Alexander Chashevsky, a Russian a physicist in the 1920s, tracked over 2000 years the fact that as the sun waxes and wanes in its 11 year cycle of solar flares at the apogee, lots of solar flares, lots of, of activity, uh, that there's a direct correlation over several thousand years between what he calls the solar maximum and human excitability. And that during times of, of uh, solar maximum, there's more wars, uh, there's more acts of genius, uh, there's more revolutionary activity, and then it'll ebb. And that's uh, uh, very interesting. And he, in fact, uh, discovered this in the First World War as a soldier on the Russian front. And he was tracking the uh, solar flares uh, sort of in his spare time. And he noticed that the intensity of the battles were correlating uh, with the uh, frequency and severity of the sun flares. And then over this last weekend, we had Roland uh, McCrady, who's the uh, director of research at the Heart Math Institute. And he was telling us more about these solar cycles. And he was also sharing some of the new research from the Heart Math Institute. Uh, as most of you know, uh, our human heart uh, if we reach coherence, we can come into coherence with the Earth's electromagnetic fields. And the Earth's magnetic fields are in sync with the solar electromagnetic fields. In fact, all of us have billions of photons that are coursing through our bodies every millisecond from the sun and from the cosmos. And these can be regulated through our heart coherence. And he was also sharing that they, they've been doing research on people who are in love, uh, even if they're in the other side of the world and they think together about the fact that they love each other. Uh, and even though they're on opposite sides of the planet, their hearts will start to come into the same coherence. And there's even research now that even if one of the partners doesn't know, the fact that one partner is beaming in on the other partner brings the other partner into coherence. Uh, and then he was telling us uh, uh, about the research that they've been doing with um, what they call the global coherence pulse, where they have um, uh, electronic uh, receptors that can measure the electromagnetic field. And they have about a dozen of them in different parts of the world. And they've been measuring uh, events uh, of, uh, of human activity. Uh, and what they found out is that when groups of people come into coherence and intentionally focus compassion to the larger world, that has a greater impact on the Earth's electromagnetic field than even massive events like the World Cup, which means that smaller groups of people in an aligned intention with positive emotions and intention can actually influence the Earth's electromagnetic field. And he spoke for at some length about the interrelationship uh, between bodies in our solar system 
and the relationship between heart and mind and cosmic uh, consciousness. And at the end of his lecture, he says there was one physicist that really understood the wholeness and how everything fits together. And that was David Baum and his notion of the implicate order. So I just wanted to bring that into our discussion today because we're gonna be talking about David Baum from some people who know a lot about him and have dedicated their lives to the wholeness of the implicate order uh, that Baum uh, spoke about and, um, and uh, wrote about with various people like Krishnamurti and others uh, in a very elegant, beautiful uh, way uh, that brought into the Western scientific consciousness uh, the notion uh, through theoretical physics of what the mystics and people of the shamanic path have known for thousands and thousands of years. And that is that we're in a whole that as Plotinus said 2000 years ago, the whole universe breathes together. So it's within that context that I'd like us all to pause as we always do as we begin our sessions on humanity rising. And today, as you center yourself in your body, close your eyes, attune yourself with your heart in a spirit of gratitude and thanksgiving. Just be aware that your coherence, your heart coherence, is affecting those who you love. It's affecting the earth and its pulse, which is in tune with the sun and the larger cosmic wholeness. So let us just attune to wholeness for just a minute through our hearts. Thank you everyone. Now with an open heart and a heart filled with gratitude and love for each and every one of you. Uh, I wanna uh, introduce our program uh, first, just to bring in one additional point that uh, Roland made. And that is that this capacity is not limited to human beings. Uh, the research they've done on animals uh, indicates they have the same capacity. Uh, and uh, also trees. They've done uh, remarkable research on trees and the resonance that trees have, not only with human communications and emotions, but with each other, with such acuity that trees uh, are beginning to emerge as the single most accurate predictor of earthquakes. That's how sensitized trees are to the larger ecosystem and to people walking by uh, and to other sentient life. It's all one, it's all whole. 
and we rest within that uh, to our edification. So I'd like to now uh, bring in uh, Jenna Axelrod. Uh, she is the Associate Director of the Perry Center uh, in one of the most beautiful spots on planet Earth, and that is Tuscany. And I'm not saying that just because I'm uh, half Italian, <laughs> because <laughs> if anybody's been to Tuscany, you're as close to paradise as uh, you're gonna find on this planet, in, in my view. Uh, so uh, Jen is also working on a, uh, a film on the absurdity of certainty, which is another aspect of the implicate uh, order. And uh, it's the Perry Center, which is uh, really dedicated to the work of David Baum and other uh, thinkers and, and scientists who are um, exploring the wholeness of the cosmic uh, Kashic field, as it were. And so they, they're uh, collectively bringing us uh, this program together. Uh, and Jen, I want to thank you for convening this panel. Uh, and I turn the program over to you. And just to say, everyone, that if you have questions or comments, write them in the chat. Uh, and uh, Jenna and her team will be monitoring uh, what you're uh, wanting to inquire about. And then we'll bring your questions and comments in uh, toward the uh, end of the program. When, when it's all done, I will circle back. Thank you, Jenna. Welcome. Thank you, Jim. Thank you all for having us. It's such an honor to be a part of this. And I agree, this is a beautiful location. It's where the center is based and we invite you all to come convene here with us. We, in next year, we believe we'll be hosting conferences in a physical location again. So we hope to have you here. I just wanna welcome you all to this event, Wholeness and Fragmentation, the life and work of David Bohm. As you heard, I'm Jenna Axrod. I'm one of the associate directors here at the Perry Center. And we specialize in promoting the work of David Bohm and Carl Jung and building on our co-founder, David Peet's respect for indigenous knowledge and his concept of gentle action. Um, as Jim briefly touched on, David Bohm, he's been described as one of the most significant and original thinkers of the 20th century, whose interests and influence extend well beyond the field of physics to include philosophy, psychology, language, religion, art, creativity, thought, and education. And underlying his innovative approach to these many issues, was the fundamental idea that beyond the visible tangible world, there lies a deeper implicate order of undivided wholeness. So that will be what we're gonna to explore today, the meaning and value and implications of David Bohm's work for the world that we live in today. And I'm really honored to bring you four panelists that are some of the dearest friends and presenters uh, to the Perry Center. So first, I have the pleasure of introducing you to Beth Macy. Um, David Bohm's science and dialogue has been core to her career as an organizational leader, consultant, and researcher. And currently, she's completing a book on the ideas and individuals who influenced Bohm's process of dialogue. Welcome, Beth. Good morning. And also on the panel is Hester Reeve. Hester is an artist who has a practice encompassing live art, philosophy, drawing, and David Bohm's dialogue and social scripture. Welcome, Hester. Hi, everybody. Also joining us today is David Schrom, who's a quantum theorist who studied under David P for his doctoral degree, our Perry Center co-founder, and with David Bohm and his postdoctoral degree. Hi, David. Good to see Hi, you. All. And Hello, also, oh, I see, I see you on two screens there, David. And Shantina Sabadini, thank you for being here with us. Shantina is a physicist who collaborated with David P running the Perry Center. Um, and in 2017, succeeded his friend and colleague as director of the center. Welcome, Shantina. Good to Thank see you. you. Jenna. Hello. Hi, everybody. Hi. So, Shantina, as the president of the Perry Center, would you like to start 
period. Off the screen. Sorry, I hear I hear somebody. Do you want? Is, I think there's a request for David to close the second screen that he has open that we don't see his face on, but we will move. Uh, my there. wife is on that, so I'll just uh, give her a shout. Caroline? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we love her. She's great. Yes, yes. yes. Yeah, I, I, I think you came in on uh, as a presenter rather than as a participant. Okay, yeah, on. if you email Eleanor, <laughs> she'll, she'll help you get on to, to watch the event. Jenna, we're, Jenna we're okay, actually, in the broadcast, we're only seeing one image. Oh, great. Thank you for that. So I'm sorry, I interrupted you, Shantina. So, as the president of the Perry Center, I thought maybe <clears> you could start us off with just a few words to give people context for our center and what brings us all together here. Sure, sure. Thank yes. you. Um, the Perry Center is located in a beautiful region, as Jim said. Uh, it's in an ancient village, a medieval village on top of a hill. Uh, about 300 people now. Uh, it used to be much larger in the past. Uh, and it was discovered, I would say, like kind of by chance by David and his wife Maureen. Uh, and they fell in love with the place and started the center in, in the year 2000. Um, it started as from a discussion of the limits of academic learning and thinking and research. And uh, from the idea of creating a space for uh, creativity in a convivial atmosphere and in openness to um, exploratory thought. And in that sense, David Bohm, who was David Pete's teacher for many years and colleague, and they wrote books together, uh, is, a, is an extraordinary example. So this place, uh, on the one hand, like breathes on this rich uh, intellectual background, and on the other hand, on the simple nature of this village and of the community that lives in it which has always been very important for us. The Paris Center is like deeply engaged in the, in the local life and experiences. And uh, um, that's, as, as a motto, the future has an ancient heart, which is well represented actually by the situation we live in in Paris. Now this ancient heart has had to take a virtual form for the last couple of years, uh, but we, we hope uh, soon, maybe next year, to be able to go back and uh, have beside uh, uh, the words we share, uh, also the sharing of friendship and good wine and dancing in the piazza as often happens during the Paris Center courses. Uh, so uh, thank you for being with us tonight. It's really great. And, <laughs> and thank you for the invitation. And let me pass the word back to Jenna to continue with the program. That was so well said. Thank you, Shantina. I, I'm, I'm glad you did not forget to mention wine and dancing as a big part <laughs> of coming here. The food, yeah. yes. So. Now I'd like to ask all of the panelists one at a time the same question, just to give everyone an introduction um, to David Bohm and yourselves, mm -hmm. which is why is David Bohm's work important to you? And I thought we could start with, with Beth. Yeah, sure. Well, to go back to the beginning on why David Bohm became important to me, I started my career quite a long time ago in the early 70s. And my early career was in the field of mental retardation. And at that point in time, there were thousands of people across the US as well as in Europe and maybe even further who were deeply involved in changing the way that we provide services to people with mental retardation. It was a huge movement. It was, it was just huge. So we changed federal laws, we changed state laws, 
Uh, I myself was deeply involved in community development at that time to begin community services. So it was a very, very big systemic change process. And that just lit up my heart. I mean, it just lit my curiosity up big time. How is it that effective change happens? How do we change social values? So those are the kinds of questions. And I was so engaged in that that I decided to go back into academia and see if I could figure out how that happened. How does change work? How does it happen? Well, I went back into the School of Management in the College of Business Administration. And what I found was that I learned very well how to analyze. So if you think about business school, there's management, marketing, mm -hmm. uh, there's uh, personnel management. And so you learn in management school to break things down and analyze. And I really valued that. I really valued that. But the thing I did not get was how to build those pieces back together into one holistic system. Now, I didn't find that until I ran into David Bohm. And when I started reading about wholeness and fragmentation, I had a, a home for that, <laughs> that information to live. And it guided me in, um, you, you know, in taking his science at times as a metaphor and be able to think, how do I translate this into a way in which I can help the organizations I was either leading or consulting to? How do we start rebuilding the fabric of, of human organization? So that was my entree. And then, Jana, back to you. Oh, that's beautiful, Beth. Hester, how is David Bohm's work or why is it important to you, Hester? Oh, I think you're still on mute. Sorry, that old chestnut, I do it every time. <laughs> <laughs> um, I first met David Bohm's work just as I stopped being an environmental activist in former Czechoslovakia and started studying philosophy of nature. And sort of series of coincidences I was looking for a way of dealing with ethics and humans' relationship to nature that wouldn't close that down and land us back in the very problems that had caused the problems. So we're talking about thought structures. Um, and when I came across his model of dialogue, it was a, both a critical, radical, but more importantly, a liberational transformative process that I felt could affect real change. Started off with the environment. Little did I know that as I then went to study philosophy as an artist, um, in David Bohm, I came again against, not against, I dove in, I d d d d d dived into, I dove, I dived, I diddled, all those things and um, found yet more rich offerings that allowed me to understand how art itself, you can have the particularity of artworks, which as an artist I'm very involved in, but that's just particular. But I'd always had a concern as an artist, and this is what drove me to be an environmental activist, was, well, yeah, but creativity seems more than that. So I'm very happy as Hester, as a creature to make artwork, but surely creativity is something else. And the mechanism for creativity, how do I think about that? And David Bohm's concepts around creativity and this new metaphysical paradigm he called art a movement um, really has helped me hold um, those important thoughts to me around thinking, creativity, the relationship of being a particular creature, but you get an ego of that. And then thinking also, not just to the social, but the cosmos. It's so hard to think about all those things without shutting them down through fixed ideas of wholeness. Um, and David Bohm allows that to sort of break open creatively um, in a way that's not overwhelming. And through the practice of dialogue, he offers a radical practice to start creatively transforming. Thank you, Hester. 
David, would you like to share why David Bohm's work is important to you? <clears throat> well, let me go back a long way to 1971 when I went to London to be a postdoctoral student with David Bohm for two years at Birkbeck College. And that was really a, a life transforming experience for me. Uh, I went there interested in physics, radical physics. I was there because I knew that Bohm was interested in radical physics. And let me explain what I mean by that. By that, I mean that quantum theorists in particular had, come use, uh, had become used to using certain calculatory methods to get answers. And they could get answers to all the questions that they posed. And so they felt quite happy with this. Bohm, however, pointed out that no one knew why these equations worked. And so uh, he then was interested in meaning behind things, what it was about. So uh, anyhow, so I went to Bohm, the radical physicist, to explore physics more deeply, to explore philosophy of science. And that's how I came. And by the time I left, my interests were really, and my focus was really, philosophy of mind and the transformation of consciousness. So this is what our <laughs> physics discussions led to. Now, this latter, the transformation of consciousness, I would say, is really at the center of all Bohm's work. It's even his physics, and of course, his dialogue process and his philosophy. And uh, so Bohm was working, his deep intent, his deep focus was to bring about a transformation of humanity, both individually and collectively. And he stressed the importance of the collective aspect. So all this leads into a very, very deep discussion of what Bohm called participatory consciousness, which we can't go into right now, which is subtle, which is nonverbal, which is born of presence. And we'll go into it as we move along. So then this takes us into a journey of unending depth into what we are individually and collectively. So you can see why David Bohm's work is important to me. Yeah, beautiful, David. Sean Pino, would you like to address this question? Sure. <clears throat> um, I met... David Bohm in various, at various stages in my life, like he appeared uh, in different incarnations of mine. And I think of him also, uh, the last one being the party center and working with David Pete, who was a friend and student of David Bohm. But the first time I met David Bohm was in 1970 at the Varena Summer School, which was a remarkable event at the time in which the, let's say, alternative interpretations of quantum physics converged. Um, I was part of one of those schools, uh, actually quite different from what uh, David Bohm was doing. So um, uh, we met as competitors, so to speak. Uh, but some years later, uh, I had the opportunity to translate his book wholeness and the implicate order into Italian. And that was like a very uh, interesting and deep dive into his thinking. Um, so we met through basically our common interest in the interpretation of quantum physics. Quantum physics, unlike classical physics, works perfectly well, but gives no intuitive sense of the quantities we're working with. Um, David Bohm proposed a way of looking at, at it which is quite radically different from the mainstream interpretation of quantum physics, which was at the time the Copenhagen interpretation. Um, and I would say one of the, one of the aspects that um, were most like um, uh, useful teaching for me 
was the ability of looking at the same reality under different perspectives, which was which David Bohm was a master at. And so I could look at it in the, in the perspective of my own thinking on the interpretation of quantum physics and his interpretation of quantum physics. And this openness to shifting perspectives is crucial in David Bohm's thinking and crucial, I would say, for our future as a species. And let me give back the word to Jenna. Beautiful. So just so people who are listening are aware of what's going to happen, I'm going to ask each panelist their own specific question, and then we'll move more into a discussion-y feeling. And we'll be looking also at the chat for anything you're curious about. So just so you know what to expect. So the first question is going to be for Beth. Beth, can you discuss the why of the deep quest that was beneath David Bohm's science and other work? Mm. Well, that's been a question that was deeply and is deeply on my mind. So I'm happy that I got that question. Uh, when I was beginning to be real serious about studying Bohm's work, I was really fortunate that David Pete, who you've heard much about already, agreed to be my mentor. And this is one of the questions that I took to David Pete. It seemed to me that unless I had a sense of David Bohm, the person, and what really was behind his motivation, I couldn't really understand his science. Now, I'm not a scientist, and so, of course, there are some restrictions anyway in terms of my understanding, but I just had the sense of we can't really get into a person's knowledge and, and their contributions to the world unless there's something that we know about the person. And so David Pete was absolutely wonderful. He gave me the opportunity to have access to some of the research he himself had done uh, about David Bohm in writing the biography of David Bohm. So what I've done today is I, wa I wanted to explore this question of what, what really was this underneath the surface mm -hmm. of, of David Bohm's thinking that drove him to some of these amazing kinds of discoveries. So I'd like to share that a bit to give us a context then for what the rest of us will be sharing later. Now to do that, what I want to do is look at specific vignettes and let David Bohm's words, and so I've taken many quotes from him, let him talk for himself here a bit. But I wanna do that by looking at his early life and looking at it in two separate uh, chunks. One is his very early life up to maybe about the time when he went to school. And I think what, what we'll find and what you might look for as I share, share some of these stories, the problems that he confronted as a very young child, the difficulties that were there. So the second chunk of the vignettes I'll share are from his kind of the, the primary ages up through young adulthood. And it's my sense that that whole series of vignettes and that stage of his life was his attempt to find some ways to resolve the early problems. So it's kind of a problem resolution orientation that I think we can see. So with that, I'd just like to start and tell you some of these stories and then again, to let David Bohm speak to us as he wishes. So to start with, David Bohm was born in 1917 and a little town in Pennsylvania called Wilkes-Barre. Now Wilkes-Barre was, was kind of right in the center of the mining areas of Pennsylvania. And their major market for their coal mines was New York City. And so this was the thriving metropolis as he was born into that area of a, a coal mining community. And his parents were both immigrants. They hadn't immigra immigrated together but they were both from Eastern European countries. And they had, their families had immigrated to the US at the point in time where those of the Jewish tradition were having a very difficult time in, in the European countries. And David Bohm's mother, whose name was Frida, Frida Bohm, was actually his favorite parent. There were times when he describes that he felt very close to her 
he, he describes her and he really cherishes the aspects of his mom uh, for her having this inner quality and inwardness he would talk about. And, and uh, her sense of spirituality, a sense of creativeness, he really valued those. But at the same time, she was also a very difficult mother. Now, she herself had been considered as a young child, she'd been considered as peculiar. And in her adult life, she actually had been diagnosed as having some relatively serious mental health issues. So she could be very volatile, very aggressive, and in fact, rather dangerous at times. So he had a yes, no kind of conversation with her, her relationship with her. Now his father, Samuel Bohm, I picture as being a young man who he had come to the U.S. when he was in his late teens, who had to reform his whole identity. Even when he went through immigration, even at that point, his name was changed. So he was a young man trying to reconvert his self-identity and his ways of survival in the world. He's very into practical things, making things work, readjusting, and he had no use whatsoever for his son's other orientations and interests. So the two of them never gelled. And in fact, Samuel Baum made no bones about expressing his difficulty with his son. So very difficult. Now the two of these two parents, they did never get along. Theirs had been an arranged marriage. It hadn't been a marriage of attraction and love. And it appears as though love and attraction never did develop between them. So they fought a lot. So what I'd like to do now is give you some of David Baum's own words and the way he describes this, this really early period of, of time in his life. So he's talking here about how his parents got along. And he says, they used to fight very hard. He would start to insult her and she would fight and get angry and shout. And sometimes she'd even threaten to kill him. Well, think about this small child with parents acting this way. He says, my father used to admit that she was very intelligent, but he hated everything else about her. And he was very disappointed in me. I didn't have any confidence in my mother's ability to take care of me. And I should have had a mother that I could have counted on. Wow. For a small child to be in that kind of situation just breaks my heart. So here's his finishing of that. <laughs> I felt that the whole trouble all around the meaninglessness of the whole situation and all the nervous neurotic reactions has sort of made me somewhat nervous, mixed up. I had the feeling that because I'd grown up there, I was not really healthy. So not really healthy. He takes this a little further than that because not only did he not have confidence in his parents, but he was losing confidence as even a child in himself. So he says, you know, and here's the context of this quote. Little boys in Wilkes-Barre were busy playing baseball, sports, activities. David Bohm wasn't any good at that. So he says, I seemed to lack coordination and I couldn't really throw a ball exactly where it was supposed to go or very far. And then in other areas, it seemed also like socially, it was very hard to figure out exactly what to do. Well, my, what a start. So think with me for just a moment. What, what might we or might he have thought of as this era? What was, what was, what would he have called that? What would he have thought of this period, this start in life? Actually, he had a, a term for it. You know what he called it? He called it 
the world of darkness. The world of darkness. I think I would add into that the world of fragmentation. Think about the fragmentation of those very early years. World of fragmentation. Well, luckily for him, as he grew and, and was a little bit more mature and he could get away from home a bit, he started to become more clever. So this is that second stage. And I, I like to describe this as the stage of strategies. So he's starting to figure out a way that he can work around the family disorder that he's grown up in. So think of these as strategies. So the first one he called figuring it out. So here's his words. He says, I felt the need somehow to be able to plan out what I would need to do. So I would say to myself, just figure it out. And then he adds, that was probably to feel more secure. Well, probably, but think about this. At this very early age, he's starting to direct his attention inwardly and we can start to see develop his later analytical capacities that took him so far. So figure it out. Well, here's another one of those strategies. I call it opposition. So his father had not been particularly warm and fuzzy. <laughs> and the two of them hadn't gotten along well. But how does David Bohm process this within himself? Well, here's his description. I didn't actually come out and charge my father with doing something wrong. But I never along, I never went along with my father at all. You can't you just picture this little David Bone putting his hands on his hip and say, not at all. <laughs> so here he is, a little oppositional kid. And that carries over into the days when he first started the school. So what was it like for him when he started to school? Well, the first thing he says is, the teachers were addicted to arbitrary authority. Well, he goes on to describe his early experience. He said, there was so much contrast because outside, before you went to school, you could just talk to anybody whenever you wanted to and you'd say, okay, and then you'd say whatever you wanted to say. And then suddenly, you couldn't say anything except what they wanted you to talk about. And then only the things they wanted to hear about. He says, and even worse, they could punish you. So here we see early on some of his orientation to opposition and to authority and to the freedom to speak. Now, I think when I read through David Bohm's stories about his lifetime, or particularly through David Pete's biography, you see David Bohm still having this attitude. You see him uh, standing up against the physics community and saying, I'm not gonna do what's popular in physics. I'm gonna do what really matters in physics. And taking his own authority then to progress in the areas which are really most meaningful. So again, here's an early strategy that follows him all the way through. Now, another is a story that comes from a time when he had uh, been in his father's used furniture store and somebody had left a magazine there. This was probably in around 1927 or so. So it was a point where he could read. And this magazine that was left was the, one of the very first magazines that was devoted to science fiction. In it, what, what he found was there's a story called The Skylark of Space. And it was a sci-fi story about the, one of the first spaceships that it was ever thought of and its captain. Well, it so lit up his imagination that he would see himself going on this spaceship, traveling across the, the cosmos, to the outermost regions of the known space and beyond, and helping this, um, this um, 
uh, transition into some very, um, some very peaceful ways. So these are some of the stories that I see that have been very, uh, very important. There's some others that have to do with social idealism, of course, and other things. But I think what we would call this is the age of light. He would call this the world of light. And I would say it also is the one that's the beginning of the world of holism, of holism, so that we can see this very early stage as being the age of darkness. This was the age of light for him. And it was the age at which he began putting together his whole idea of, whole, of the holistic world and where we could go within it. So with that, Jenna, I will turn it back to you. Thank you, Beth. That was really a whole new set of perspective on, on his background for me. Thank you. I feel bad for little baby David Bohm. <laughs> <laughs> so moving on to um, Shantana, would you give us a little background on uh, David Bohm's contribution to physics and the relevance to the notion of wholeness in physics, Shantina. <coughs> yes, yes. Thank um, you. Thank you, Jenna. David Bohm's contribution to physics uh, has to do uh, with the notion of locality and non-locality, which is closely connected to the idea of wholeness. Um, he was one of the uh, carrier of various interpretations of quantum physics. Um, and he was like quite innovative in breaking through uh, a notion which had been deeply rooted in, in physical thinking, which is the notion of locality or that in, in classical physics, and, and even in, in quantum physics up to a point, um, things interact by touching each other or by sh in sending a signal, sending uh, a, a kind of an action, a field, uh, particles traveling, or, um, some physical action connecting things. That had been like a, a I would say, a, a standard, a dogma of, of, of physics for a long time. Um, in 1935, Einstein proposed an experiment in which um, two things which have interacted and then have been separated keep talking to each other, so to speak, so that when a measurement is done on one of them, it influences the statistics of results on, on the other part, which was um, an anathema for physics thinking of the day. And Einstein proposed it as a challenge to quantum physics. Uh, if quantum physics predicts something so strange, uh, this what um, Einstein called spooky action at a distance, if physics, if quantum physics predicts this, then there's something wrong with quantum physics. Well, it's quite interesting that um, Einstein was one of the founders of quantum physics himself, but not so happy about the, the interpretations that had been developed of it. He was convinced that you have to dig a little deeper and you will discover a reality which is uh, much more solid than this fluid, like ungraspable nature of quantum reality. So he proposed this experiment as a challenge to quantum physics. Um, and that was quite troublesome to Bohr, who was the main um, ideologist, I would say, of quantum physics. Uh, but it was later proved that uh, that behavior is incompatible with the notion of the, the world having a physical description 
and being made of local things. Well, David Bohm um, broke what was uh, by that time considered like an, uh, an acquired knowledge, uh, which was that um, it was not possible to, to study, to go beyond or beneath quantum physics uh, in by, by discovering what were called the, the hidden variables influencing quantum behavior. Well, David Bohm showed that yes, it is possible. It is possible to, um, to, to describe the same results of quantum physics through uh, something happening at a deeper level, which was initially considered like uh, this um, hidden variables and which will eventually mature in, in David Bohm's thinking with the notion of uh, uh, implicate order. Although this notion is not developed mathematically, but it points to another form of order uh, and one which has a deep sense of oneness, a deep sense of wholeness in that uh, it, it involves uh, what Bohm called the quantum potential, uh, involves a field which is, um, shares information in the whole cosmos instantaneously. So um, there's, there's a, a deep sense of, of wholeness came back uh, into physics uh, through the work of David Bohm, not accepted by the mainstream uh, physics, but more, now more and more um, reconsidered and brought back to the attention of the physics community. Um, when th this experiment of Einstein uh, of spooky action at a distance is actually a manifestation of we now what, what we now call entanglement. Entanglement is this um, capacity of like sharing uh, kind of a, a common a common identity at at a distance. Um, it was it was at the time of Einstein and then at, at the times of the young young Bohm. Uh, Anathema, as they said, it's no longer that. It's it's now standard accepted physics, and it's even like the main property which is used to build quantum computers. Um, so we are we are immersed in a, a field emptying up, a field like spreading throughout the whole universe. We are entangled with everything else. And the only reason why we're not aware of it or not consciously aware of it um, is that the entanglement at that level is infinitely complex. It's way too complex for us to grasp. In order to observe it, we have to create an um, a very sophisticated, isolated environment. All these things happen inside vacuum tubes with a high, very, very high level of vacuum so that any interaction with the rest of the universe is cut out. But if that is not the case, then we are part of an infinite entangled field. And this notion, which uh, Bohm, I think, is, is a, um, a pioneer of, is now resurfacing in various forms. Okay, um, let me just break here. This, it would be uh, much longer to give a thorough uh, account of Bohm's work. Uh. Shantina, thank you. 
we'll, we'll, I'm sure we'll get back into um, to tie into entanglement, subject dear to my heart. All right. <laughs> David, would you mind stepping in now um, and helping us? How does Bohm's work on consciousness relate to wholeness and fragmentation? Is that something David be uh, able to step in on? Sure. Um, just let me say a quick word of continuity from Shantina, who's very nicely brought out the physical aspect of the deeper order of the universe um, where everything uh, is really emergent from a deeply vast uh, entangled whole. And that is that, um, of course, we are emergent from that. And so uh, what this does then is it unifies both uh, physics as we know it, the material world and consciousness. And we don't know how far we can go in observing this in physics, but David Bohm felt that one deep possibility is that as we are universe, we may be able to observe it in ourselves in what would normally be called uh, deep meditative states. We can become awake and aware to our participation in a deeper implicate or implicit or out of sight reality. So I just want to mention that to follow up on Shantina just a little bit uh, because we've been invited to do that. Uh, because that leads into um, the question uh, about David Bohm's work on consciousness and how this relates to wholeness and fragmentation. Well, I would say that all of David Bohm's work is really about wholeness. You know, again, that uh, the universe in its material dimensions and its psychological dimensions is one divided, interacting, integrated whole. And so we sometimes talk about achieving wholeness, but I think Bohm would say, no, everything is whole. It is one whole um, system. And um, when we talk about fragmentation, we may be talking about our own approach to this wholeness, then I may approach it in a fragmented way. So if I approach a whole system in a fragmented way, uh, I'm likely to create a wholeness which is chaotic, which is fragmented, which is incoherent. Whereas if I meet wholeness in a holistic way, then I'm likely to be a participant in something which is flowing, moving in a harmonious way. So fragmentation is an attitude. Wholeness is a fact. The universe is one divided, uh, undivided, uh, coherent, uh, moving whole. And Bowman Einstein really had this uh, view in common that, um, you know, uh, ending the Descartes mind matter split, which has really caused us to come to where we are. So I think society has become greatly aware of wholeness in terms of the environment, in terms of uh, the earth being an ecosystem. I think what we haven't become aware of is the, what you might call the ecosystem of thought perhaps what Teilhard de Chardin called the newosphere. It's not just the, say, biosphere that is one integrated whole in a material way, but so also is our consciousness. And I think we don't realize this, we don't recognize it um, because we feel very individual, very particular, very personal. But perhaps, Bohm is suggesting, that this is because we live on the surface of our minds and we're not aware of its deep enfolded, implicate, implicit order, which is there by intimations and so on. And so, I mean, this comes back to the old view of the iceberg, right? The surface consciousness being the structure, uh, 
above uh, surface consciousness being what I'm aware of. And then there's a much greater part of the iceberg below. And Bohm is indicating that that part of what we are is something which is pretty much the same for all of us. It's common to all of humanity. And that it has grown up uh, recently over millennia through culture, the development of language and so on. And then beyond that, through vast time, through biology, through evolution and so on. And that really our brains are very, very ancient. I think we're not aware of that necessarily. So Bohm felt that it's really important to explore the bottom part of the iceberg. But what he also brought about in a way that Carl Jung did also is that the iceberg is floating in a sea, a vast sea, which is not bound by form. And so, of course, this is all very metaphorical, but I think it's important to realize that, um, that what is important is not only the part of the iceberg that's out of sight, which Bohm called the tacit infrastructure of consciousness, tacit meaning silent. And infrastructure, we know what that means. But beyond that, uh, there's this vast sea. And the importance of that is that the surface mind and the unconscious mind are both mechanical, they work by machinery. And if that's all there was, then uh, where would we have intelligence, creativity, perception, and so on. So um, this view uh, David Bohm uh, brings us to. Um, now, the question, the big question is, how are we to explore this unconscious tacit infrastructure, which is much greater than our surface mind, and as Bohm would say, is uh, the much more important part. He would say that uh, the part that you can hold in your hand, that you can grasp in consciousness as we know it, is really quite limited. And that which is more ephemeral, evanescent, swift moving and so on, too swift for the processes of thought is really what is important uh, that foundation uh, in the transformation of human mind. So this leads us into a deep, deep, long subject, which is participatory consciousness. Um, and I'm not sure how, I think I'll just say very, very little, but what we're used to is verbal, conceptual, literal consciousness, consciousness which is about my thoughts and feelings and experiences and thing, things that I can store in memory and bring forward. But participatory consciousness is quite different. It's nonverbal, it's embodied, so on. Uh, a, a simple way of introducing it is, think about riding a bike. You know, when you get a bicycle, you don't get a manual as to how to ride a bike. You couldn't really write one. You have to learn how to participate with the bike in an embodied flowing movement. Now, to take this a step further, Albert Einstein used participatory consciousness in his deep, uh, math in his deep uh, physical explorations and his production of relativity theory, general relativity in particular. He talks about uh, the fact that what he did was nonverbal and embodied. And then only later in the secondary stage uh, did he bring in, you know, the formal part where it becomes intellectual, uh, conceptual, formalized as ideas and formulas and so on. And David Bohm used this approach also. And interestingly enough, um, well, Bohm and Einstein did have contact and Einstein said that he considered Bohm his spiritual successor, uh, a successor in the spirit of the deep process that Einstein uh, used, we'll say. Now, Einstein um, called 
David calls this participatory consciousness. Einstein instead just called it intuition. And uh, Einstein would uh, contrast the intuitive mind with the rational mind, the rational mind being based in uh, our knowledge and uh, our processes of reasoning and processing knowledge. And uh, he said something which I feel is quite beautiful. Einstein said, the, the um, intuitive mind is a sacred gift. The rational mind is a faithful servant. We've created a society which honors the servant and has forgotten the gift. So this, in my view, is really what David Bohm is all about, bringing us to participatory consciousness, to remedying this, to opening out the deeper, subtler levels of mind so that mind can come to an order in itself and an order in relationship to others and to the world around it. So, yes, participatory consciousness, one could go on at length, but let me just point out maybe a factor of it, which is really important. Participatory consciousness is not necessarily cumulative. Ordinarily, we think of um, learning, of understanding. What does it mean to understand something? Here's what I'm trained in. This is the way I live, coming in, in this culture. To understand something is to see how it fits into my framework of thinking. And if I have it fit coherently, I say I understand it. And I also have it in memory. I can now pull it out and use it. But participatory understanding is quite different from that. It's much subtler. It doesn't necessarily leave a residue at all. It's not necessarily cumulative. It's really a learning which is unlearning. It's an unraveling of structure process at the subliminal level. Uh, unraveling of blocks which limit the free play, the intelligent free play of the mind. So it's a late negative learning. So, and this is uh, really the basis of Bohm dialogue. It's a negative learning in which, well, positive learning, which we're used to, the further you go, the more you become the expert. In negative learning, the further you know, the more you become the beginner. So that's touching on that briefly, uh, but it's a, you know, a vast and wonderful subject and, uh, and uh, well yeah. worth exploring. So. Yeah, thank you for giving us so many touch points into that rich subject matter, David. I really appreciate mm -hmm. that. Hester, would you like to expound on that and give us a, a bit of a view on how does Bohm speak to you regarding art and social transformation? Let me um, see if I... There you I'm are. Hi. I'm just still... Um receiving David's um, words and um, what you conveyed. Um, what, a, what a perfect, if that's, I don't even want to use the word perfect, that won't work. What, a, what an appropriate way to touch on something that I think is both really direct and simple. I'm talking about David Bohm's dialogue here. And it's direct and simple because you, you don't need to train to do it. You don't need any equipment. You just need a sense of the people coming together. As David Bohm said once, um, if you want to change culture, you know, you have to, there has to be a nucleus, but he, he didn't really mean a nucleus as in one person or a leader. He said that the nucleus, he meant nucleus as in something deep and potentially not obvious or literal. And he equated that nucleus with a perception that something needed to be done. So a lot of what we've been saying might sound 
abstract on some level. It doesn't sound totally abstract in a negative way. I'm not suggesting that. But what's so remarkable with David Bohm is for all that level of thinking and its impact on our being, you know, this is thinking to affect how we are in the world and perceive the world, whether through physics or culture, um, or the way we are together as language. Um, but that, and of course I'm gonna lose my train of thought because I do that when I dip in and I'm not even gonna apologize because- No, dip, that's, dip, that's, love it. That's it. Um, and, and because I'm, I'm taking that from Dave. That's where Dave unschools my mind and allows it to tune in and touch on, um, touch is the right word, these, wor these words. But anyway, this, this nucleus, um, and then David Bohm goes on to say, you know, though not obvious, it's about this common perceived need to do something. And that's so powerful because he doesn't mean at that point, right, let's sit down, get together and discuss a plan. That's what's so amazing and sort of dumbfounding to people that care about change, which I actually think is most of us, if we care to really allow that to sit with us. It's just such a difficult, disturbing, overwhelming thing that, and there's been so much change and work for change in the world. There has, it's a mess, but we know that there are a lot of human beings who have and are really working for change in ways we would all be very inspired by and yet look at where we are. I mean, the darkness of the world, I mean, that's so chilling. And you can talk about that in terms of psychological well-being of certain humans in certain parts of the world, but particularly the non-human and nature and the planet, which are all part of our of of the wider whole of, you know. Um, I'm very nervous with the word whole because I think we complete, not that anyone in this beautiful community is doing that, but we can so easily please ourselves with that word. We do need to use it, but it's it's a difficult one, isn't it? Because our ideas and our brains are geared through this systematic way of thinking that Bohm was so concerned we challenge and work with through transformation of consciousness. Um, we can too easily think we're there or we're somewhere when we're actually we're not. And I think um, Dave, when you say the further you know, the more you become the beginner in that unknowing sense. Um, this is something that makes Bone Dialogue so specifically different to what we commonly call dialogue. And I'm not saying that to say, this is it folks, forget any other models of dialogue. Although I personally have, you know, I feel the transformation that happens through dialogue, um, Bone Dialogue. Um, and now I'm going to go into another wormhole, so don't worry, I'll, I'll capture it back. <laughs> um, that's quite good because as I'm doing that, I'm, I'm aware that I'm doing a sort of movement and um, with Bohm Dialogue, um, that sense of movement is very important. Now, anyway, sorry, I might, there's me saying, it's so concrete that within all that, David Bohm talks about this deeper sense, the nucleus of needing to do something. He, he raised his back as some sort of urge, urgency for us to come together. But that doesn't mean we start with the content or we even start with the problem. And we actually start in a position of that nucleus and of recognizing the need for as much as possible a freedom. So I'm... <coughs> Oh, I think Hester. Hester, you me. hit your audio button. We lost you, your sound for a second. She's muted herself. Yeah, that's great, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> You're back, fine. No, we hear you, you sound great. <laughs> um, yeah, well, maybe, but it's, it's so important to talk about these things, but um, it's also so inadequate in a way. So um, I'm just going to say, I'm going to give you a few little shapes and don't for one moment think that I've summed up David Bohm's dialogue because it's quite impossible to do. Um, and that really, like many important things, it's the process you have to be involved in. 
um, so just to make it more ta tangible, um, in, in a BOEM dialogue, a group of people come together and meet and open up a radically free space between them. There is an acknowledgement that we have to acknowledge where we are. I don't mean that in a literal sense, but that we just start with the people in the group and that it is about participation in trying to attune into a shared meaning. And that means we have to drop all presuppositions of what we even think a shared meaning might be at that particular moment, in that particular cultural context, with that particular group of people. And we have to find a way to start that together or as I would say, dive, dive into where that takes us, which sometimes means no speaking. And David Bohm, in his book on dialogue, which if anyone's interested, really read that book, talks about the fact that it is a collective participation, but importantly, and this leads on from what Dave's been saying, it's also to bring our awareness to a participation in the non-human. And as Shantana said, that entanglement happens on levels that are way too complicated, sensitive for us as instruments to possibly pick up on. But we, we are that nonetheless, and we are part of it. So the dialogue is also an opportunity to be aware of that. And that's where it comes back to this paradox of the particular, less in terms of ego or the straight divisions and blocks of being an individual, but the fact that you are living, breathing flesh, you are of it in that room able to um, extend away from potentially the structures of thinking by both questioning them in yourself internally and questioning together as a group and not expecting to arrive at a particular end. And of course, one might say, well, that's all very well, but how can that transform society? But then I go back to what I started with. For all the good of the many efforts and movements to transform society, none of which I would wish were undone, we haven't transformed society in any fundamental way in terms of the darkness of the world. And by that, I don't just mean the, the human world. So we do actually need a really radical shift. And my experience is that this, the, 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 the process of dialogue might seem so tiny and local, but I can't see how there is any other place to start with the very thinking and language that is also blocking us from transformation. It's, it's a hard thing to do and everyone present in this panel and all our many deep friends who are part of Paris Centre and Bones Dialogue Circles around the world who are working with this, we all go up and down as well with our experience and, and I, although that can be distressing to myself as well, to myself as well, that we often fail, we, we don't begin. There is so much learning and I really do feel that there is some movement beyond ourselves and what Bohm would call hollow flux. We don't know it, we don't touch it, but there can be some movement. Yeah, and like everyone else is saying, there's a lot to say, but um, I would rather be just in a dialogue circle with you. So I'll end it there. Thank you, Hester. Yeah, let's bring everybody onto the screen and this time has gone so quickly that I think I'm going to ask all of you um, to dialogue as you wish based on what's been inspired by each other, but also want to remind us of um, the title of our, of our coming together today. So just to get us started, I'd throw out how do Bohm's ideas on wholeness and fragmentation relate to modern issues facing society. But don't feel bound by, by my boundary. 
I just noticed that this has 10 minutes left and wanted to give you a chance to, to come in on that. So, and that's for, for all of our panelists to, to think on or, or not. I would like, yeah. Something, something that came to my mind listening particularly to Esther now and, and in connection with uh, um, the need for change and, uh, and, and how that need for change is connected with changing our mind in the first place. Um, I'm, I, I was reminded of, of a short chapter of the Lao Tzu the Tao Te Ching, uh, about uh, knowledge and about the Tao. And he says, um, if you seek knowledge, day by day you increase. If you seek the Tao, day by day you decrease. Decreasing and again decreasing, you reach to non-doing. By non-doing, nothing is left undone. Mm. I'd like to say with that, that um, coming back to art, if I may, and I don't mean prosaic art in a gallery, there's a beautiful quote by David Bohm where he says, Thought, thought forms like this, like it's a paradox what you express there. But that doesn't, but that's what our fragmented system of thought and language tries to protect us from because we want these knowns and these solids. And we understand why. It's not that we're, but actually what our mind needs to be doing is embracing these kind of paradoxes. They are art forms, they're not problems. I mean, I think sometimes the very notion that what we're dealing with is problems is part of the problem. Um, so it's like there's something of an art form to work with with the mind, but it's not about knowing something and a content, but the mind is almost shaped. And I, through that, when you speak that Shantana, my head has to deal with it. It's le less that Hester's thinking and more like my brain as a creature of the world is shaping <laughs> and I think that that's really important and my experience of being in a dialogue a bone dialogue and really they need to be at least a day because there's so many habits and everything that need to be worked through is that I feel like my brain has gone to the gym like and I'm talking physically the muscle as if I've used aspects of my brain that haven't been used before and you feel crystal clear um, afterwards um, so, anyway, there's something in that that I think is important. Esther, I love I love following the mo the movement of your hands. It's like it's coming into your mind through that. <laughs> <laughs> I can't think unless I do that. <laughs> I wonder if I could add that, following along from both of you, there's a part of David Baum's writing where he's talking about problems as the portal, now that was my word, but maybe the gateway for major transformation. And Hester, you talked about paradox. He says, noticing that paradox is really where we get to the gateway. And the way that he would guide us through is by holding the tension, you know, back to the somatic, the body sense, being able, and particularly if we're in a dialogue situation, being able to actually hold that emotional content, the feeling content in our body until it works its way through. And then he says, if we do that, if we go all the way to the end with it, what happens then is that intelligence can work. So I, to me, that's just really one of the key parts. And I thank you for uh, reminding me of it. Yeah. Yeah. So this is an interesting uh, matter then, how, 
how intelligence works because we usually relate intelligence to intellect, uh, which is working with knowledge and reason. But the etymology of the word interledgera means between the lines. And so intelligence, real intelligence, is not simply understanding the lines, the words, the ideas, the concepts, but the open quality that allows perception of what lies between the lines. And we might call this the implicit order, you know? And so this means that dialogue done this way then becomes something which is very much heartfelt. You know, uh, we tend to start in a head felt space, <laughs> so to put it, but uh, yeah, it, it opens other dimensions of us and it helps us to perhaps use the brain a little less as a computer, which is working according to its own programs and more as, as David Bowman would say, as an antenna, which is receptive to that which is not of its own proclivities and structure and knowing. And enter into the mystery in a sense. David, I have a question for you there. When, when I've read some of Bohm's work, and I can't quote it exactly, but he talks about intelligence as well as, as I understand, the intelligence of the universe, which has intention. So does, is, is that also meaning that if we're able to get ourselves out of the way, that there's something more of the overall intelligence that can work through us? Am I, am I stretching that too much? What, what does he mean when he says, we get out of the way so that intelligence can work? Well, <clears throat> if the brain is to function as an antenna, mm -hmm. uh, and of course to do that, I, with my particular proclivities and ways of processing things and thinking and so on, my whole framework, have to, in some sense, suspend, get out of the way, uh, go into quiescence, then I'm not sure that any of us can say what we open the door to. Mm -hmm. You see, I, I don't think that it is limited. And uh, I don't think that we're in a position to say clearly, uh, so an awful lot about it because it becomes more, not a matter of knowing something, but participating in the movement of something which is unknown. And then in that participation of, in the movement and the embodiment of it, we know in a way which has no words. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if that mm -hmm. comes close to the kind of thing that you're talking about. I think our old Taoist Shantina could probably uh, <laughs> put, put some beautiful words around that. <laughs> well, thank you, everyone. Uh, Jenna, this has been a, a wonderful assemblage of intelligences. Uh, They're such and, beautiful people, aren't they? So are you. <laughs> Thank you for having us. Well, it was, what's been striking me, uh, just to start with uh, your last comment, David, about intelligence being that capacity to perceive between the lines, between the worlds, is, is what's coming through. I think all of you have been straining at the limits of language to express an experience of wholeness that, in the very act of qualification disappears. Uh, and that's what makes uh, David Baum's work so profound, but also so subtle. And the reason why, you know, 50 years on, mainstream physics has yet to fully grok what it was that he was talking about as he was um, uh, seeking to express this very Taoist nuancing between you know, the word uh, that can be spoken is not the, 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 the true, the Tao that can be spoken is not the true Tao. But similarly, um, you know, the Tao that is spoken 
can be the true Tao if it's spoken from the framework of the nonverbal. And that's the paradox, I think, of language and poetry and music, that occasionally that which is quantifiable can express the non-quantifiable. And that's the magic and mystery of, of how we're trying to communicate uh, with each other. So I just want to uh, thank you uh, all for bringing that out. And I just wanted to make two other quick comments. Uh, Beth, I loved your stories. You know, I've read a lot about Bombay. I didn't have no idea. <laughs> the, the, uh, the kind of the turbulence of his domestic situation when he was a child. And as you say, you know, it was reflected and refracted through uh, his uh, relationships with Einstein and all the other physicists, you know, when he came up with these theories and was essentially rejected uh, and had to go out into the wilderness of, uh, of uh, the world and physics um, and was never, you know, ended up with Krishnamurti and was never uh, reconciled in a, or, 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 or received back in, and, and, and you can, um, it reminded me of the, the great line from Nietzsche, you know, that all philosophy is biography. Mm-hmm. You know, that had he not gone through that breaking out and the turbulence, he may not have been able to break out of the mainstream physics to see the implicate order. You know, so, uh, uh, you know, philosophy is biography. And I, I, I just felt it so strongly as you were um, uh, speaking, you know, and then the, 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 the other comment, um, you know, that, that you were making, um, uh, Shantina, that fragmentation is an attitude and wholeness is a fact. David, David, David Shum said that. Yes. Yeah. I David. mean, that's uh, that's just so that's so profound for us to realize okay. in our completely yeah. fragmented world right now. That this is all about the perceptions of attitudes and prejudice, and it has virtually nothing to do with reality, right. which is whole. And I think we're in a moment in history which where the fragmentation has become so stark and almost so violent, I think particularly in the United States, um, uh, but also elsewhere that it's, it's easy to lose track of the fact that, that wholeness even exists, um, let alone that it can be brought into the public debate, into the public square. Um, and, um, you know, and, and, uh, and your comment, Hester, that, that uh, even when we think we've got it, most of the time we do not. Because <laughs> we try to grasp it as a line. And it's actually between the lines. And uh, so it's a very slippery thing, this reality. Uh, it's like the, you know, the blind men and the elephant. Uh, in a in a fundamental way, so the, the the way you folks have just teased out these complexities today, and Jenna for your masterful weaving, I just want to thank um, all of you uh, for uh, for this uh, illumination, uh, particularly at a time where I think it's a fair statement to say that you know we're in a great darkness in the world, and wholeness has become very elusive. And, uh, and uh, as we know from even the climate science, uh, it's not only the, the um, wholeness has become elusive, but we're on a accelerating momentum off the cliff. Mm. How we at this time bring the reality of what you're talking about uh, and the implicit order is, 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 is probably the greatest challenge humanity has ever faced. Because if we go off the cliff this time, there may be no coming back. And so somehow um, uh, you're laying out um, a very deep uh, reckoning 
but also a challenge for us as we, we move forward. So I just wanna acknowledge that and thank you all for your contributions today. I'm reminded of a sentence by Einstein referring to war, but it could be taken more generally about the, about the situation we're living in, about the darkness that you're talking about. He said, like, I don't, know, I don't know what weapons the Third World War will be fought with, but the fourth one will be fought with sticks and throw and, and stone. <laughs> yeah, indeed, indeed, indeed. I want, thank you so much for having us, Jim, and the whole community. I, I just want the community to know I saw your beautiful questions and I just couldn't figure out how to jump in with them. <laughs> but you asked some really beautiful questions and I'm so sorry we didn't get to cover them. Uh, but we'll, I'll log into the, the follow-up after chat and, and can raise them there. I'm not sure who will be able to join there, but I just... Thank you so much for bringing us all together. Speaking of wholeness. With pleasure. You know, we should do it again. David Baum is uh, one of the giants of our time. And he's a giant that's getting taller and taller <laughs> with time. Yeah. And so uh, having you back, let's be in touch, uh, uh, Jenna. And uh, Hester, you're going to the cop? Did you say? No, I, I think was I said did I say COP is coming up, but I'm, I'm not going there. Oh, okay. Because we're doing Someone a big uh, so program on, uh, on the COP for humanity rising between the 1st and the 12th oh, of, uh, of November. And uh, Jenna, we might be in touch. Maybe we can work in David Baum <laughs> somehow. Absolutely. We'd God be knows honored. the world needs him. We um, would be honored. Yeah, thank you. And then tomorrow, everyone, we're going to have a, uh, a, uh, an unusual session. We're going to have um, a session of, of all women uh, talking about men. <laughs> and uh, one of the critical reasons why we're going off the cliff is because we're uh, at the end of uh, probably 6,000 years of patriarchy. And uh, I think it's a fair statement that men have made a total hash of everything. <laughs> And so one of the meta themes that we've been developing in Humanity Rising is, is what does man, woman, gender, sexuality mean in a post-patriarchal world? It's worth contemplating that these categories of maleness and femaleness um, have been stratified through a patriarchal worldview. And that's slowly breaking down and all kinds of fluidities are beginning to emerge. So we've been having a series on, um, on men and, and what, it's, what, what men's liberation looks like as women liberate and bring themselves more fully into the public domain and into leadership. Um, how do men in their own way go through the same process of liberation from a, a system that it's enslaved both in a fundamental way? Uh, and we're gearing up uh, November 15 through 19 for what we're calling the masculine dialogues. Uh, uh, whither the male uh, as we move into the future. And tomorrow we thought we would just have a session, uh, which is our last session, um, uh, before we have the dialogues on the 15th of, to the 19th of November and just have a group of women uh, talk to us about how they view uh, the future of uh, evolution uh, for the male uh, at this time uh, in history. So that'll be tomorrow on Humanity Rising. But Jenna, uh, Shantina, David, uh, Hester, and Beth, marvelous session today, beautiful illumination of David Bohm. I uh, thank you so much. Uh, you're all welcome to the after chat and uh, the link is in the uh, chat box and we'll see you all again tomorrow here on Humanity Rising. Bye for now. Bye, thank yeah. you. Jenna, I can't come to the after chat. I'm sorry, my mother's ill, so I'm- I Oh, I'm so sorry, Hester. Well, no pressure. We, we, I didn't warn you that there may be one, so that's my fault. And oh, I no, will. I, 
aware that I think they'd sent an email. To okay. Spend. Anyway, that, that I would normally join because I think it's nice to hear people who have come, but between this and another Zoom call, I really need to call my mother. <laughs> I totally understand that. I just wanted you to know that one of the participants wanted to know if you were a speaker at C the COP conference. They were really moved and assumed you'd be bringing these ideas there. So if every, only there's a lot of... I'd be too nervous probably to do that, but these ideas really do belong there, don't they? Someone also needs to say for all well, the importance of that address and the new technologies, there is this work that is fundamental.